My name is Jillian DePetta, and I am the uh, coordinator of the Matigaman Native Plant Nursery at Alderville Black Oak Savannah. So the Alderville Black Oak Savannah was founded approximately 20 years ago um, by a man named Rick Beaver, who is an elder biologist and artist in the Alderville uh, First Nation community. And this land was slated for development actually, and Rick was walking in this area where we're standing today and identified some indicator species of tall grass prairie and black oak savanna. And so he brought this information to chief and council and the land was protected. So that's sort of how we got our start. And um, the land's been stewarded, of course, by the First Nations for thousands of years. and. It is now um, our small team that is maintaining and managing these, this site. We've uh, recently acquired a second and are um, now focusing on three pillars in our mandate, ecological restoration, outreach and education, and research. And um, our field team focuses on a lot of uh, prescribed burning and then invasive species removal and finally seed collection and treatment and spreading that seed onto the sites, which is what we're going to talk about today. The extent of tall grass prairie and black oak savanna ecosystems collectively referred to as grassland ecosystems in North America is actually uh, less than 3% of its original range at this point. Um, in Ontario, it used to um, occur in swaths from Sarnia essentially all the way up to Kingston area and now it's um, extremely fragmented and degraded with only little pockets of remnants here and there. Um, this site is actually the largest intact tract left in uh, eastern Ontario at this point so um, it's of great significance in that regard. Uh, one key kind of difference between a prairie and black oak savanna ecosystem is the amount of tree cover. So they're both grasslands, so they have less than kind of 30 to 40 percent tree cover, but a prairie will have less than 10 percent, and a savanna is sort of between that 10 and 30 to 40 percent with more dappled shade. So the black oak is our sort of keystone species here at the black oak savanna and our namesake. What you're looking at behind me here is tall grass prairie community transitioning into oak savanna. From a seed collection standpoint, we can find different plants in the different communities. And so sort of right behind me here, you can see um, yellow savanna grass. There's little blue stem. There's some big blue stem here as well. Um, and then a lot of wildflowers that are still in flower, a lot of the asters and goldenrods, this is sort of their time to, to be in flower, their time to shine. So here we have some little blue stem. It's pretty much ripe now. You can see sort of these uh, structures surrounding, like these hairs surrounding the seed. Um, that's a good indicator that the seed is ready for harvest. The other um, Sort of telltale sign is that the seed separates from the stem readily. So if you draw your hand up the stem, you can see that some stem, or sorry, some seeds persisted. So um, I think ideally we'd be waiting a little bit longer before we collect these seeds, but we've got some seed in hand here. That's what that looks like there. Um, yeah, and I'll just sort of run my hand across the stem and try and collect some more. So there's some more that came off, but you can see some persisting. And I mean, I would say that it's pretty good practice to, you know, you want to leave seed. Uh, generally speaking, we're only collecting, we're not collecting more than 10% of any seed of any population. So if you imagine out of 10 plants, you'd only collect, um, you know, one of those plants worth of seeds. It's a pretty good practice. But if you sort of, for the example of little blue stem here, you know, we're, we're collecting a little bit from each plant um, and that's just a good way to promote genetic diversity in terms of prop propagating seeds. So here we have some big blue stem, also known as turkey foot grass, <laughs> called turkey foot grass because it's got sort of like three uh, stems of seeds. And so to collect this grass, 
not unlike the other grasses that we've talked about, uh, you just pull, put your hands on the stem and just pull up and it should come off very readily. You can sort of see there's a bit of a color variation too where the less ripe is kind of green and purple, whereas the more ripe becomes sort of more of a straw color. It's kind of yellowish or gold. Um, and that's a good indicator that the seed's ready as well. So here we have butterfly milkweed. Um, another name for it is just butterfly weed. You know that the seed is beginning to ripen when you have some pods that are starting to open. And so what you'd look for is just this floss um, sort of you know, dancing in the wind. And then what I feel for is like, a part of it is the color of the pods. They start to, as they're ripening, they sort of turn more reddish, almost brown, um, and not as green as they were earlier in the season. But when you feel it, there should be some air space in there. But there's actually um, a seam here and you sort of just open it up at the seam like that. You know, the seeds are ripe when they're dark in color. They're no longer sort of green and translucent. There's a lot less uh, moisture in this pot as well. And so what I do is I release the bottom here like that. And then you can just pinch the top and then run your finger along cleaning the stems floss free. If you want to get some nice clean seed in a hurry, this is the way to do it. So here we have uh, New Jersey tea. This is actually a low growing shrub associated with tall grass prairie communities. It has really dark green leaves here. Um, many, many stems. You know, if you're growing it in a garden setting, it wouldn't start off with this many stems. This it has, happens over time as the plant matures. Um, here are the seed pods, the fruits. Um, one thing I will say about this plant is it has these really lovely uh, white flower heads um, midsummer. It's a pollinator and insect magnet. This has these fruits which actually, these capsules which exp explode and so you can see right, actually here's a good example, I'll just pluck this. Here's the comparison of capsules um, that have already sort of catapulted their seeds out. And then here are capsules that are persisting. And so when we collect this seed, um, you can use a pair of scissors or secateurs to actually cut this. Uh, but for our purposes, we generally just run our hands along it. You can sort of grind your fingers together like that. And then you've got some seed pods there. When you're collecting this seed just by hand like this, you may want to wear gloves. Here we have uh, Lespedeza capitata, also known as round-headed bush clover. Um, these darker structures here are the seed pods. They have these really beautiful white uh, pea-like flowers. It's a legume, so it's fixing nitrogen in um, the tall grass prairie community it's really important because it's actually fixing nitrogen in the soil for other plants um, to access. So some incidental seed collection and um, seed dispersal. We've got some showy tick seed here really well adapted to broadcasted seed all over sort of relying on humans amongst other creatures uh, to carry its seeds long and far. It's another uh, legume and fixes nitrogen in the tall grass prairie community. Alrighty, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about some of the tools that we have for seed collection. So a good pair of scissors um, is great for cutting the stems, um, a marker for recording information, um, some paper bags. You don't really want to use plastic because plastic traps moisture, so a breathable bag. 
Um, here's a bin that I will put the seed in after we've cleaned it. And then we have a scale. We're always recording our seed collection um, uh, weights. So now I'm just gonna demonstrate using a, a leaf mulcher to process this seed um, with larger volumes of seed. It's really a, an effective way to basically separate the seed from the husk or the fruit um, in order to extract the seed. Get everything that's in the crevices there. Here's a bunch of the seeds separated from the fruit or extracted from the fruit. What you can do from this stage is actually to take it to a series of sieves uh, or screens. So here we have um, some screens, which you know uh, we are using. The, the coarser screen is hardware cloth. The finer screen is actually just um, like window screen and then put the seed and chaff through the screen. For smaller volumes, you can use uh, containers like this. Um, again, just making sure that the, the, you're not trapping moisture. Um, so you can take your seed, put it in a container like this. You can also um, have your labeled uh, bags and sort of seal the bag off and using some tape, you can just tape that and then sort of again, put it in, putting it in the fridge. Uh, the advantage of paper bags is that they breathe um, so that we're not trapping moisture. Trapped moisture can just lead to molds and mildews that will actually sort of damage the viability uh, of the seed. Thank you for virtually joining us at the Alderville Black Oak Savannah and Alderville First Nation today. And we hope that you learned a lot about Tallgrass Prairie, Black Oak Savannah, and seed collection. Bye-bye. <laughs>